Y'all already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life. And we're back. How do you get arrested and sent to prison for being a drug addict? Behind crimes you committed to feed your addiction. Behind just giving up on life and succumbing to your addiction. Only to get to prison, not have learned your lesson, and continue to get high. Continue to do heroin. I didn't think before I got to prison that this was the world I was going to step into. Man, was I wrong. I done seen it. I done lived through it. So y'all know what we got to do. Let's relive it. I know a lot of people this day and time that are on dope, that are on heroin. I know a lot of people that I grew up with, went to school with, met along the way that have lost their lives to heroin. Close friends. Just, it's a sad thing. A lot of people watching me right now grew up in neighborhoods and households where seeing somebody shoot dope was an everyday thing. Where seeing a burnt spoon or a syringe laying around was an everyday you know, day thing. Where going outside and seeing people getting high and selling those type of drugs was an everyday thing. That wasn't my life. And it's probably not the life of also a lot of people watching me right now. A lot of people are going to hear things today that'll make them uneasy that they didn't know about. That's a first for them. And it's a glimpse into what really takes place out here. I had homeboys that grew up with parents that were heroin addicts. That would lose a parent along the way to their addiction, lose another parent to the system, to the penitentiary. And almost all of them went on to become heroin addicts. And going to prison, you would think that if you watch TV and you've never been locked up like that, that that's what it's going to be like. When it comes to these shows that y'all watch, 60 Days In, these other little reality shows, they show you what they want you to see. What they're not showing you is what's really taking place when nobody's looking. These dudes aren't dumb. They know there's a camera there. They're only going to let you see but so much. Nobody wants to be the guy that was on national TV shooting dope in a cell for the whole world to see. I would come to find out that is the reality of prison. It was the reality of all the prisons that I've been in. And today we're going to get into that. Y'all ready? Let's jump into the first story. So y'all gonna hear a little bit of noise in the background, man. I got guys demoing. We started a new house today out in Petersburg. So they're throwing stuff in dumpsters. But with this story, rather than start at the beginning, I'm gonna start at the end. Coming out of prison, I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't focused on what everybody else was doing, what had happened while I was gone. Things that would be taking place when I came out. I knew a lot of people had died. I'd heard about the overdoses. And in the week I stepped out, I realized real quick. The prison most likely saved me. When I left the streets, I knew of a couple of dudes that were snorting dope. I knew some of the people that were shooting dope. But I had never... Sat and witnessed anybody shoot dope. Why lie? Make myself seem like, you know, that was what I, I was into or seeing. I hadn't seen that. I arrived home. Ten years have passed. When I left, everybody had just started, you know, eating the perks all day. Zannies was something we had been doing since the teens, so the Xanax was nothing new. But guys had upgraded. Now they're taking oxys all day. I head off to prison. The pill mills get real big. For y'all don't know, the pill mills are these doctors that were just writing everybody prescriptions for all these crazy, you know, painkillers and stuff. So that was starting to happen right before I left, right? Everybody's starting to mess with the perks. 
I didn't get into the perks. Then, you know, took them a couple times. Shit's turned my stomach upside down. Not my thing. I was more on the Zans, right? I returned home and all the people that were left that weren't dead, that hadn't overdosed or been sent to prison for a very long time, those people were no longer doing Percocets. They were no longer snorting oxys. They weren't worried about anything but what they had graduated to. Heroin. When they shut these pill mills down and these guys couldn't get these pills like they used to, everybody moved towards heroin. They didn't realize how sick they were or that they even had a problem when they could walk in a doctor's office and walk out with 180 Percocets four or five times a month. They had an endless supply and they were everywhere. But then the government comes in, the police come in, they crack down. And while I'm incarcerated, everybody goes from the pills to the heroin. Some of my friends actually had conditions. Dudes had been shot and needed pills to help deal with the pain. Dudes that got hurt, car accidents, one way or another, needed pills that, you know, help with the pain. Well, once they shut down the pill operation, a lot of people that needed these pills got cut off. I would run into dudes once I got out. Loved ones, people that I was close to, that didn't resemble anybody I'd ever met. People that looked like they had aged 25 years in the 10 years I was gone. Guys, I expected to still be hustling just like they were when I left. The guys that had all the jewelry, the nice clothes, the fresher shoes, the nice car. A whole stable full of, of females. These are now guys that are out there buying dope. These guys are now walking. I wasn't really ready for it. I didn't I didn't know, man. I'd only heard. When you're incarcerated, you only hear. You don't get to see it firsthand. You hear such and such overdose and died. Damn. She was getting high? Such and such overdose and died. Damn, she was getting high? I would start to hear this so much throughout my bid that I got to a point where I didn't even like to use the phone because call her home could be bittersweet. It could be great that I get to talk to someone I love, but it's terrible when you get that bad news. So I told you we're going to start at the end and that's going to be the last few years of my bid. This wasn't when it was the heaviest, but this is when I must say it kind of got to its grimiest point. I would show up at this place, this, this Indian Creek place in Chesapeake, that a large majority of the population there are there because they had some type of a substance abuse problem. I shouldn't have been there. There was no reason for me to be there. I had violent charges. Most of these guys were there for stealing, fraud, things related to them trying to feed their addiction. I wouldn't even be there a total of maybe two days. And I walked in the bathroom. Yeah, it was my second day. I walked in the bathroom late night. Everybody's sleeping in bunks. It's a big dorm. There's bunks everywhere. Like if you can picture a military barrack with just bunk beds everywhere. There's bunks and lines everywhere. And it's late, late night. And I'm just, I'm asleep. I wake up. Got to pee. I rub my eyes. We got a community bathroom, it's a bunch of toilets, a bunch of urinals, a bunch of sinks, big open shower. Everybody showers, you know, in this one big room. There's no privacy. But I would make my way to this bathroom and I would walk in and you got to swing these little like stall doors open to swing back and forth. Like you see in old Western movies. Bottom half's gone, top half's gone. It's like a three foot door, about two foot off the ground. I push the door open, I walk in. And there's a dude sitting on the toilet. Looks up at me real quick. Because I guess he thought maybe I was a guard or something. Looks up, realizes I'm not a guard. And he goes back to what he's doing. He's sitting on the toilet. And he's shooting heroin. I thought that in leaving the last place. 
I wouldn't have to deal with this like this. I thought this was supposed to be this therapeutic community place, a lower level that guys weren't going to be getting high like that. But sure enough, I walk in the bathroom, go to the, you know, go through the door and there's a dude just shooting dope right out in the open. Don't even say a word to me. Looks and just goes back to what he's doing. Went laid in my bed and laid there for a second just like, why, man? Why, why, why? In the days to come, I would walk, you know, the track, walk the yard. There would be guys randomly posted up. I've walked past piles of throw up. See guys walking that had done too much dope or the dope was too strong. And they'd just be walking, stop, and they would puke. There'd be guys sitting along the side of the fence, side of the buildings, nodding out all the way out from the dope. I said, oh, man, this place was flooded. We go to chow one day, and when we're in the chow hall, you got a bunch of officers that stand in there to try to, I guess, control the inmates, keep the peace in case anything happens, make sure nobody's stealing extra trays or passing anything off or doing anything they shouldn't be doing in the chow hall. And I get up, put my tray in the, you know, in the chuck hole, I'm leaving out the building. I'm headed back to my building. And as I'm heading to my building, a bunch of officers come running out the hall. And this is a lot of officers. This is about six, seven officers run straight past me. And they're running to the building I'm in. Me, I'm thinking somebody's got the fight in. They're trying to break up a fight. You know what I mean? That's what's going on. I go into the building and they buzz me through. And I'm headed to my bunk. And I look over and these officers are dispersed. In between bunks. The bunks are only about two and a half feet apart. And there's a guy laid out over here. There's a guy laid out over here. There's a guy laid out in the back. Some bad dope had hit the yard. And just like that, three people overdosed while we were in the chow hall. They waited for everybody to leave. Everybody to go eat. They stayed back because they had other plans. Their plan was, all right, when nobody's around, it gives me time to do this dope, shoot this dope. And that's what they did. I don't know if the guys died. I don't know what happened. I know they were pumping on one dude's chest, you know, administering the Narcan shots, put dudes on stretches, nurses running in and out. I mean, just guards. They were just complete chaos. They told all of us, go to the front, which was the day room, is what they called it. Everybody stick to the day room, stick to the day room, stay out the bunk area. Took the three dudes up out of there. There was another dude that showed up there that hated this place so much. I mean, he hated this place. Soon as he got there, I don't think he had been there a full two, three hours. He hollered at one of the dope boys, hollered at somebody else, and got himself a syringe. They would come. If you sat in your bunk area while you were supposed to be in this group, the counselors would come up and say something to you. The guards would say something to you. And they would let you sit there sometimes upwards of a week before they were like, all right, he's not going to do the program. He's not going to do this, so we're just going to lock him up. No sooner this dude gets there, he tells him, I don't want to be here. Ship me up off here. You know what I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing this, man. Y'all pissing everybody. Like, no, nah, I got to go. You would think he would want to stay there because what he's into is vagrant there. It's everywhere. You know, it's, it's very just, it's just available. There's no lie. This dude goes and when you sit in between your bunk, if you're on the outside walls, there's two lockers and then you can put your chair in between two lockers and there's a brick wall behind you that runs the length of the building where all the bunks are butted up to. He is sitting in this area, in his chair, and waits until one of the counselors comes by Sees him, and when he sees her making her way through there, telling guys, hey, y'all need to go up front to the group. You need to go up front. You can't be sitting back here. You got to get up or I'm going to write you up. He waits until she gets in. Plain view of him. Had already made his dope shot. Takes his shot right in front of her. This is a counselor who had probably never seen anything like this in her life except for on TV. She had heard people talk about it all the time. 
their addiction, this and that. I don't think she'd ever seen nobody actually using heroin. She turns around, goes to the officers, goes up to the control booth. They call some officers in. The guy took it, put it with a piece of tape, stuck it in his hiding spot. They come in, and by the time they get there, he's slumped. He's, he's conscious. He's aware, but he is high. I mean, dude is, like I said, man, that dude is he's, he's high as astronaut socks. You know what I mean? He is up there. They get him up. He's all wobbly. They search the area. They find the residue in the bottom of the can that he had cooked up in. They find the needle, and they ship him up off there. The lengths that some people will go to get high are crazy. Especially knowing that you're going to get pissed. Knowing you're going to go for your analysis. Knowing they're looking for this. But he would rather catch a street charge and more time for possession of a controlled substance, narcotics, all this different stuff than have been at this program. Crazy, crazy things, man. Breaking news tonight from Virginia where seven inmates are being treated for suspected drug overdoses. We're told another inmate has now died. Now, those overdoses took place around 7.15 this evening at the Haynesville Correctional Center. Now, that's about an hour east of Richmond. Virginia's Department of Corrections emergency response teams have now been activated. The facility has canceled visitation for tomorrow. So what you just saw and heard is not uncommon. What's uncommon is them putting it on the news and you actually hearing about it. They want you to be stuck with the, the image and the thoughts that if you've got a loved one that's on drugs, when they get to prison, they're off drugs. That couldn't be further from the truth. They only speak on these things, like I've said in the past, when it gets so big that it makes its way to the media or somebody calls home and then their family calls the news people. The prison is not calling the news ever to come up there and admit that they got these issues going on. Admit that this is taking place because it makes them look bad. People start to question, why do y'all get all this money for these prisons and these jails? Who's not doing their job that y'all have got this many people overdosing? and y'all got people dying? <sighs> It's a common thing. Now with Greensville, I told y'all, I think in a couple different stories, one of my first glimpses into the, the heroin stuff and what people were doing was me walking the yard and seeing a bunch of guys sitting along the fence line, passing the bottom of a can. Like if you take a can and you flip it over, it's hollowed out. They'd all put their dope in there and agreed on how much they were supposed to get into this syringe. And they were passing this needle and this can down the line. And I just walked by these guys as they're nonchalantly shooting dope with the same needle. Just like we would sit around and pass a joint or pass a blunt back and forth. They're doing this, but they're doing it with heroin and they're doing it with a needle. A lot of guys I knew up there overdosed. A lot of times it was hidden. There were several, you know, several situations where I had to help. I had to go get ice. We do different things to try to get these guys to come back through because if they overdose and the guard finds out about it and we can't revive them and the nurses have to come in, we're going on lock. Nobody wants to be in a cell locked down week after week after week because this dumbass dude did some dope and just fell out, right? We had, and I'm going to leave real names out of the stories I got going on because I'm not here to tarnish nobody. If you're, you know, you got some, some bad paperwork or something, I'll blast you. But this dude, this dude in general was a dude by the name of Slim. Anybody that's been up Greensville knows who Slim is. Now, when I think of tattoo artists up Greensville that were good, and when I mean good, I mean like phenomenal Worthy of any tattoo magazine, Ink Masters, any show you could ever think of that would crush any of these dudes out here when it comes to Single Needle. I think of Slim, Spike, and Buzz. Slim was just on some next level shit with tattooing. Just, he could do portraits that looked better than the actual picture. This dude could do everything from, 
you know, a picture of your mom down to, you know, lettering on your body that looked like it was put on by a machine. Then you got Spike. Spike's been released. Spike, if you see this, hey, big salute to you, man. Welcome home. Spike finally came home, made parole after almost 40 years. Homeboy Joey told me about Spike being home. Hey, salute to you too, Joey. That's the Joey from the, the fight with the head crip dude. They didn't mess with none of that. Dude Buzz was a monster. Spike was a monster. Neither one of them messed with it. But Slim, Slim liked to get high. Slim liked to get high to the point that he was so nice with that tattoo gun that them dope boys would get that pack and they would go to Slim before they even attempted to make their money to try to break Slim off a big chunk of this heroin so that they could get in line, cut everybody else, and come home from prison with work that looks like it came out of one of the best shops, you know, in the United States. I had set up to go upstairs with Slim to get my back done. And on the day I'm supposed to go upstairs, I'm going to do what's called 229. That's the code for the charge if you get caught in an unauthorized area. You're not allowed to just go in different dorms and pods. You're in an unauthorized area. They hit you with what's called a 229. 229 can come with anything from a loss of canteen to an institutional fine, loss of good time, possible hold, depending on where they find you at. I was going to 229. I was going to sneak my way upstairs, get in the Slim's pod, and have him start lining my back. So this day rolls around, this weekend rolls around, and I had told Slim in advance, I said, Slim, don't be getting all messed up, man. It's a weekend, it's a Saturday. I know the pack's going to hit today. I know you want to get high, like, man, don't be getting all messed up and tattooing my back, man, don't. You know what I mean? Wait till after you're done with my stuff, and I don't care what you do. You're a grown man, handle your business, right? That evening rolls around when everybody slides out to wreck. I'm supposed to slide up the back staircase, sneak into Slim's pod, sit in there a couple hours, get all the line work done, and start some of the shading. I'll do this on two or three more occasions until we're done with my back. They call wreck, they call standby for wreck. And they would always come stand, they call standby to let you know something's about to happen. Stand by for chow. Get ready for chow. Stand by for church services. Get ready for church. Stand by for wreck. Get your water, your cup, you know, your towel, whatever you're gonna take outside with you and stand by for wreck. So we're on standby for wreck. I'm at the back door. I got all my tattoo equipment with me. I told you I wouldn't let people use that stuff on me. I got a bam a hit on me. Not in me, on me. I'm not I'm not hooping nothing. That's disgusting anyway. Why would you stick something in your butt you can get tattooed with? But back to the story, I'm standing at the back door and I'm waiting to go out the back door to the wreck, you know, when they open the wreck door to let everybody out, I'm gonna slide up the staircase and go to Slim's pod. Just waiting like I'm going to wreck. Lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. Everybody's got a lockdown. It means we ain't going to wreck. Whatever's going on is gonna take some time. We all locked down. We start to hear, you know, all the guards, they lock us on our cell, the guards that were standing there were getting ready to let us out. Took off, out after they got us all locked up, back out the pod. They all disappear. We don't know what's going on. Five days later, we come out of our cell. We have now went on this major lockdown. They have come through with the drug dogs. They have come through with the certain team they use, they call the strike force, to search all our cells. They bring in all their different gadgets to search for things. They're out there on the yard with metal detectors, walking around looking for stuff. We went on a major lockdown, right? The reason behind it being that right after they did count and they called standby for wreck, right before I went upstairs, was supposed to go upstairs when wreck was called to meet with Slim, Slim took his shot of dope. The guards walking by, just doing his rounds like they do. They'll just periodically walk by looking at cells. Slim is laying on the floor, then slid off the toilet bowl and is laying on the floor. I'm responsive. They get to checking on Slim. Lock everybody down, lock everybody down. They find the paraphernalia, find the needle, find all that stuff laying right there. 
Slim has either done too much dope or some dope that was too strong and it has laid his ass out. If Selly doesn't know what's going on, if Selly, Slim has shut the door, if Selly it went like he was going to wreck and was waiting and the guard walks by, looks in the door and there lay Slim. Slim would get transferred. That'd be the end of Slim. Slim, I'm sure, caught more time because they caught him in possession of heroin. A lot of other people got caught with shit if they didn't flush it throughout the five days of this shakedown. This was early on in my 10 years. I would go on to, you know, have an MS-13 dude do my back, chop, did an amazing job. Termite, Diablo, all these different dudes, you know, tattooed on me, all amazing artists. I probably, honestly, realistically, probably have about 12 different artists work on me. But yeah, Slim was gone just like that. Slim had the means of, with his gift, and what he could do with that tattoo gun of leaving out of prison easily with the couple years that he had with $100,000 on his books. Could have easily. But Slim took his talent and blew it on getting high. And that's something a lot of people watching this do. I can't tell you how many people I know that are good people, that are smart, that if they just applied themselves to a career, a job, running a company, being a parent, just being a citizen, they could be amazing. If they put half the effort that they put into getting high, into doing what's right, they'd be unstoppable. See, people are under the impression that when people go to prison, their addiction stops. That they're no longer getting high. That's not the truth. The truth of the matter is, if you want to get high, you'll find a way. And on the day that you want to stop getting high, you will stop getting high. I know I'll get a lot of messages in the comment section saying, I'm in recovery. I was an addict. I'm still an addict. Whatever the case may be. Before I get out of here, let me leave this with y'all. I know guys who have cold turkey stopped. I know people that woke up one day and said, this ain't for me no more. I'm not doing methadone. I'm not doing some boxing. I'm not trading one thing for another. I quit. And they went through the struggle of quitting. They went through the pains. They were sick. They went down the entire road that they knew laid ahead of him or them that most addicts are afraid of. And that's why most people continue to get high. It's not because they're really looking to get high anymore. It's because they get to a point where if they don't get high, they become sick. What happens if tomorrow you wake up and you say, I'm ready to be sick. I'll go through this. And after this, I can have my life back. After this, I can be the father or the mother I'm supposed to be. That's something that anybody that's dealing with something like this shouldn't wait till tomorrow to do. They should do right now. Because what you do tonight may make it where tomorrow don't come. You might sit down tonight and be like, all right, I'm going to do this one last time and I'm done. I'm going to show the world that, uh, you know, they were wrong about me, that I can be better than I've been. You do that shot and you don't remember anything. It's lights out. It's like somebody just flicked a switch. You went to sleep and you never woke up again. But then everybody else in this world is left putting the pieces back together and dealing with the loss because they love your ass. And you never have to see it. You never have to watch your children cry. You don't have to watch your parents scramble to come up with the money to put you in the ground. Because, hey, you're just getting high, right? Just one last time. Just one last time. It's a crazy video for me to do, man, just because it hits so, so close to home with so many people I care about. So many people I knew over the years, friends I've lost. You know, some of them are still here but just because of who they became along their journey of getting high. I had to shut it down and cut them off. I encourage anybody watching this that's dealing with what's going on to make a change now. You have to change your life. Before something happens in your life, 
that changes everybody else's life around you. And you never even know about it. Crazy, man. But anyways, these jails, detention centers, prisons, facilities, they're all just crazier worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams, Let's Live Life. And to all my real ones and the awesome real ones watching, because y'all still watching me. Y'all know how we do. Salute.